Welcome everyone. Pleased to have you here with us today for, uh, I think it's our 39th session of This is CDR. Um, this is CDR is an online event series presented by Open Air to uh, explore the wide range of carbon dioxide removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and to deployed and to contextualize them for policy proposals uh, Open Air is working on um, advancing in New York and other states and jurisdictions. Everyone, if you haven't done so, please feel free to uh, introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're zooming in from. My name is Toby Bryce. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York, and I work on carbon removal policy advocacy and market development with Open Air. Quick background on Open Air. If you're not familiar with us, we're a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon removal solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. Uh, we're a global community growing quickly, and we collaborate uh, on shared open source missions in the areas of policy advocacy, research and development, and activist CDR market development. Um, there should be a link in the chat to fill out a form, which allows you to join our group, and we'd love to have you. There's plenty of work to be done, and uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. So please uh, take a look at that and consider signing up for uh, Open Air. Before we get started, uh, most of you are, are familiar if you're here, but we want to talk about what the carbon removal actually means. Um, we and the IPCC define it as purposeful human activity to capture CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. When we consider CDR as we are today with the series, uh, it's essential first and foremost to emphasize that carbon removal is not in any way, shape, or form an alternative to reducing emissions. We must reduce global emissions and decarbonize our economy as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. That said, there's clear scientific consensus, including in very stark terms expressed in the recent IPCC AR6 Working Group 3 report, which I think we'll probably talk about today, that carbon removal will be required at gigaton scale by mid-century, that's billions of tons per year, to counteract, um, to counteract those emissions that are difficult or inequitable to abate, and ultimately to start removing the tremendous excess of anthropogenic carbon carbon dioxide we already have in the atmosphere so we can restore our climate to a safer and healthier state, which we're already seeing today that our climate is not in a safe and healthy state. So carbon removal is not an optional activity. It's required along with emissions reductions as a climate solution to um, achieve our climate goals. Um, a couple resources we're going to put in the chat to learn more about carbon removal. Um, we so as I mentioned, this is our 39th, this is CDR, so there'll be a link to those recordings, which are all on YouTube. Um, there's a little logo in the bottom right of the screen for the carbon dioxide removal primer, which is a peer-reviewed uh, 50 academic experts put together this online textbook of carbon removal, which is a great place to start. And uh, Chris Neidel, Open Air's co-founder, who's running the chat, will put a few other links in the chat to share if you want to learn more. And we're going to learn more today. Uh, my colleague, Mega Raghavan, is going to hop on now to uh, talk a little bit about Run of Show and introduce today's speaker. Hey everyone, I'm Mega. Uh, I'm an open air me member based in London uh, and I work on policy and advocacy opportunities out in California where I'm from. Um, as usual, so we're going to start with some housekeeping notes. So our format will be a quick presentation uh, followed by a few prepared questions and then moderated audience Q&A. Um, so please type any questions you have into the Q&A box. Make sure you find the one that says Q&A, not the chat. Um, and the event is being recorded, so we'll send that video link out to everyone who registered and also post it to Open Air's website and our YouTube channel. Um, all right, so this week on This is CDR, we're very happy to welcome Dr. De Dr. Zeke Hausfather, Climate Research Lead for Stripe, to tell us about Frontier Climate and Advanced Market Commitments, or AMCs, uh, as well as to walk us through the underlying carbon map that both ne necessitates and constrains CDR. Zeke is the climate research lead for Stripe. He's a climate scientist whose research focuses on carbon removal, observational temperature records, climate models, and mitigation technologies. Zeke spent 10 years working as a data scientist and entrepreneur in the clean tech sector, where he was the lead data scientist at SS, the chief scientist at C3AI, and the co-founder and chief scientist of Efficiency 2.0. He worked as a research scientist with Berkeley Earth, was the senior climate analyst at Project Drawdown, the US analyst for Carbon Brief, and the director of climate and energy at the Breakthrough Institute. He has master degrees in environmental science from Yale University and Freie Universität Amsterdam, and a PhD in climate science from the University of California, Berkeley. So Zeke, whenever you're ready, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen really quick. Okay, Great. can you guys all see that? That's good. Perfect. 
Um, well, thanks everyone. It is great to be here today. Um, Toby stole only a bit of my thunder, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to be talking a bit about, you know, starting broadly with the state of the climate, uh, the role of CDR in meeting our most ambitious mitigation targets and some of the pitfalls around it. Uh, and then talk a bit about, you know, what we're doing at Stripe and with Frontier uh, in terms of building the market. Uh, I want to make sure to leave lots of time for questions uh, and a uh, broader discussion after I'm done. Um, and, you know, as I'm going, feel free to, to pop any questions you might have into the chat. Um, so without further ado, let's kick off. Um, so folks may have seen figures like this in the past. Uh, this is the global temperature record that's produced by Berkeley Earth, uh, which is uh, a research group that I've worked with for about a decade now, um, or actually a little over a decade. Uh, every blue dot is a year's temperature anomaly relative to the late 1800s when records began. Uh, and the dashed line is essentially what would happen if the world kept warming at the rate it's been warming over the last 50 years. Uh, so if global warming broadly continues, if we don't reduce emissions, we'd expect to pass 1.5 degrees, uh, which is sort of the global target for uh, where we want to ideally end up uh, in the early part of the next decade uh, and pass two degrees uh, in the late 2050s. Um, and unfortunately, that is more or less the path we're on today. Um, countries have made some commitments to reduce their emissions, uh, but broadly speaking, the world is on track for a plateauing of global emissions, which means a linear increase in temperatures going forward. Um, though some progress, as I mentioned, has been made. A, a decade ago, it seemed like we were on track for a particularly dark climate future. You know, Global coal use had doubled over the course of the 2000s. Global emissions increased by 33% in just one decade. Uh, and the idea that the 21st century would be dominated by coal you know, didn't seem that far-fetched to many people. Uh, fast forward a decade later, the world is in a very different place. Global coal use peaked in 2013. Um, and while it may surpass that at some point in the future, it's unlikely to surpass it by much. Uh, the IEA now argues that global coal is going to be in structural decline for much of the century, uh, in part because it's simply more expensive than cleaner alternatives like renewables and natural gas in many places. Uh, at the same time, you know, we've seen dramatic cost declines in clean energy, uh, and we've seen an increased amount of ambition by countries who have increasingly committed to climate policies that reduce their emissions. Um, so this figure is from a piece I published in Nature a few months back uh, with Fran Moore at UC Davis. And this shows the full range of outcomes assessed in the most recent IPCC report, which is sort of the, the gray uh, envelope, uh, as well as a narrower range that's consistent with current policies and future commitments that have been made by countries. Um, and on the right side, you can see the respective ranges of current policies that are in place today, uh, the range of climate outcomes that could happen if countries meet their sort of 2030 Paris Agreement commitments, but nothing else. Uh, and then finally, We've seen in the last few years a proliferation of net zero pledges. Uh, so now countries representing over 75% of global emissions have committed to get their emissions to net zero uh, by the middle uh, or latter half of the 21st century. Uh, and if all of those commitments were met, which is a big if, uh, we would limit warming to just under two degrees as a best estimate. Um, and that itself is a big change from where we were a few years ago. Um, almost no countries outside of the EU had net zero commitments uh, four years ago, uh, and today most countries in the world do, including places like India and China. And so if countries meet those commitments, we really could be on track to meet some of our you know, more ambitious climate goals, even if 1.5 degrees is not necessarily in, in the envelope of possibilities there. Um, that said, we talk a lot about most likely climate outcomes under different scenarios, but we also have to recognize that the climate is very uncertain. Um, in particular, there's two factors, or I should say, there's three factors that determine the amount of future warming the world experiences. There's our emissions, which we can control. And then there's how sensitive the climate is to our emissions. So how clouds change, how water vapor in the atmosphere changes, how sea ice and land ice changes and affects the reflectivity of the Earth's surface. And those are hard to model with certainty. Uh, and for that reason, you know, when we say, we think if we double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the world will warm by three degrees centigrade. There's really a big uncertainty range of anywhere between you know, two and four degrees around that, or 2.5 and four. Um, and on top of that, there's another uncertainty that we don't appreciate as much as we should, which is carbon cycle feedback uncertainties. Um, so right now, about half of the CO2 we put up in the atmosphere stays there. The other half is absorbed by the biosphere and the oceans. 
Uh, and that's great because it means that climate change is half as bad as it would be if all the CO2 emitted remained in the atmosphere. The problem is those natural carbon sinks are expected to weaken under higher warming scenarios. Um, the ability of the ocean to take up our CO2 will be reduced as the pH of surface waters increases. The ability of vegetation to take up CO2 will be decreased as we see more frequent wildfires and high temperatures lead to soil carbon loss uh, through drier soils. Um, and so we're not entirely sure how big an effect that'll have, uh, but that adds some you know, significant uncertainty on top of all these other estimates. And that's why we have these wide ranges of climate outcomes in 2100. Um, so I don't wanna to talk too much about broader climate science, but happy to answer any questions folks have about that. Um, but where does CDR come into this equation? Uh, you know, As Toby said in the introduction, it's very clear that to meet any of our climate goals, be it 1.5C or 2C, we need very rapid mitigation. Um, there's no world where we can just stop increasing emissions uh, and not end up at three degrees or, or close to that by the end of the century. Um, the challenge is, even if we rapidly reduce emissions, there are some emissions that are going to be hard to fully eliminate. Uh, and so that's why we need carbon dioxide removal to counterbalance those, uh, as well as dealing with overshoot. Uh, this is a figure from the most recent IPCC report in working group three. It's more of a, a stylized figure, but it sort of shows the, the relative effects uh, or the relative emissions of CO2 uh, from fossil fuels, uh, CO2 emissions from uh, managed lands, so deforestation emissions primarily, uh, and then non-CO2 greenhouse gases, which themselves are quite important, uh, as well as looking at the CO2 removal in managed lands and other CO2 removals, which are primarily permanent carbon removal through technological means. In these models, this is primarily BEX, uh, but to be honest, don't read too much into that. Uh, very few integrated assessment models in the most recent IPCC report actually included uh, director capture or, and none of them included enhanced weathering, or I think one did. Um, and you know, none have ocean alkalinity enhancement or, or any of the other solutions we're looking at. And so in many ways, BEX or bioenergy with carbon capture and storage is sort of a proxy for all permanent CDR uh, in terms of its role in the models. Um, and as we've learned in recent years, there are probably going to be a lot more limitations on BACs or bikers uh, than we initially expected when a lot of these models were parameterized, um, particularly around trade-offs between agricultural land and land used for bio crops and bioenergy. So when we look at CDR and particularly the discussion of CDR in the most recent IPCC report, uh, there's sort of five different uses for it. There's five different reasons why the models employ a decent amount of CDR. Uh, and each of these is important for its own right. You know, the first and, and probably the most straightforward is that there's some parts of the economy that are going to be hard and very expensive to completely decarbonize. Things like aviation, some CO2 emissions from agriculture, some parts of industrial heat, we don't really have great solutions for today. And while we might develop those solutions in the future, it's also quite possible that there'll be at least a couple gigatons of emissions globally where it's cheaper to remove CO2 from the atmosphere to counterbalance those than to fully eliminate every single bit of CO2 from the economy. Um, that said, we don't have a great sense today of how big that amount of residual emissions is. And so there really is more research needed here uh, for us to help get a sense of uh, exactly how much residual CO2 emissions we'll have left. The second reason we'll need CDR is to counterbalance non-CO2 greenhouse gases. Um, the, IP, the recent IPCC report actually had some very interesting analysis of this. They found that in the models they assessed, uh, we can get about 50% reductions in methane and nitrous oxide globally with the best available technologies today, uh, and potentially up to 66% if we also have large scale behavioral changes. So switching away from consuming red meat and things like that. Um, but unlike with CO2, where we actually can get pretty darn close to zero, you know, we're still gonna have probably 33 or about, about a third of current methane and nitrous oxide emissions still around, even in scenarios where we get everything else as, as close to zero as possible. Uh, and that means there'll be an important role of CDR to counterbalance these resi residual non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this is very clearly true for nitrous oxide, which behaves very similar to CO2 and is very long lived. Methane is a bit more complicated. Um, so today, most countries that have made net zero commitments have done so using global warming potential equivalencies, uh, which essentially means you have to counterbalance methane with CDR. Uh, from the climate's perspective, as long as methane emissions aren't increasing, uh, it doesn't cause additional warming. And so you know, if you have some residual methane emissions left over, you don't necessarily need to counterbalance those on an ongoing basis because it's not cumulative. But 
we'll see if if we end up having any sort of change in targets to account for that. But at least today, the way that these net zero targets are being set by countries, you need CDR to counterbalance methane because methane is converted into CO2 equivalencies. Um, the third reason is dealing with overshoot. So it is increasingly likely and almost certain, to be honest, at this point, that we're going to pass 1.5 degrees in the next few decades. Uh, so in the most recent IPCC report, they looked at 230 different scenarios for the limited warming to 1.5 degrees by the end of the century. And 221 of those 230 scenarios passed 1.5 C on the way there. 96% of the scenarios that they ran could not limit warming to 1.5 degrees without overshoot. And only CDR can permanently lower global temperatures once we reach net zero, uh, particularly because the warming from falling aerosol emissions will counterbalance most of the cooling we get from reducing short-lived climate pollutants like CH4. Um, and that's an important point uh, that we can't really ignore aerosols in these calculations. And so once you get emissions to net zero, the world stops warming, which is a good thing. In fact, one of the more recent findings we've, we've done through you know, multiple Earth system model assessments is that once you get global emissions to zero, there's not a certain amount of warming still in the pipeline or still locked in. Uh, and that's because falling atmospheric CO2 concentrations at net zero counterbalance additional warming of the oceans as they get closer to equilibrium. And so you end up with flat temperatures at least for four or five centuries after you reach net zero. But once you reach net zero, temperatures don't fall back down, at least for many centuries to come. And so the only way to deal with that and to get temperatures back down if we overshoot a target like 1.5 degrees is through carbon dioxide removal. Uh, the fourth reason is hedging against climate system uncertainties. So as I discussed earlier, you know, we get best estimates of where the world is going to end up under different emissions pathways, but there's these big uncertainties from climate sensitivity and carbon cycle feedbacks. And unfortunately, those are really hard uncertainties to reduce. And so we're not going to know for sure where the world is going to end up in terms of warming until it's too late to change course. Um, which effectively means that CDR is an important hedge there. So if we think we're heading toward 1.8 degrees, but we actually end up at 2.5 degrees because climate sensitivity is on the high end, then only CDR can bring us back down. Uh, well, and solar radiation management, but that's a temporary solution and a can of worms that I probably don't want to get into. Uh, and then finally, there's this question of sort of climate reparations or expansion of the carbon budget. Uh, David Wells Wells had a great piece on this uh, in the latter part of last year. Um, but essentially, rich countries have emitted a huge amount of emissions over the past few centuries. CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere. And so most of the warming that the world has experienced so far is due to rich country emissions. Um, there is a huge equity issue around requiring dramatic emission reductions by poor countries when they are not responsible for most cumulative emissions. And so CDR can in some ways serve as a way to expand the carbon budget for poor countries uh, if rich countries are willing to deploy CDR to make up for some of their historical emissions. So we've talked about why we need CDR in these models. At the same time, it's really important not to see CDR as a replacement for deep mitigation. Um, and you know, to quote the Princess Bride, anyone who tells you otherwise is selling something. And so we have seen a few examples in the last few years of people overselling CDR, uh, showing scenarios that, to be honest, are completely unrealistic in terms of the role CDR could play. Um, so on the left is a figure from uh, Oxy and, and 1.5C's recent investor deck where they have 10 billion tons per year of technological CDR in eight years globally, which is not going to happen, uh, and a world where we get to net zero by only actually reducing fossil fuel use by 33% globally, uh, and all the rest is CCS and CDR. Um, and you know that is both a very unlikely outcome and you know, really plays into the concerns a lot of climate activists and NGOs rightfully have around you know, CDR as a moral hazard. Because if we really do believe scenarios like this, where we could only make relatively small changes in global fossil fuel use and still get to net zero, um, you know, that has a big potential of backfiring and a big potential of not panning out. Uh, another example of sort of overselling CDR is the most recent uh, California Air Resources Board draft scoping plan. Uh, where they had 180 million metric tons of direct air capture in California alone by 2035, counterbalancing 50% of current emissions, um, which, to be honest, is a little silly uh, and far too ambitious, and or sorry, far, far too little ambition in terms of actual emission reductions. Uh, so what I generally see as a good rule of thumb for this is, you know, realistic scenarios should have probably around 90% mitigation and 
removal or neutralization to make up for residual emissions and then some additional CDR on top of that to deal with things like overshoot or equity considerations. Uh, if you see some a scenario where it's you know more than 20% say CDR and only 80% reductions, you should probably treat it pretty skeptically. Um, again, we don't know exactly where things are going to end up, um, but while a lot of us are fairly bullish on CDR, we should also be bullish on other technologies that will allow us to decarbonize other sectors of the economy down the road. Um, and so when it comes to CDR, you know, this is really the decade for us to figure out what works. Uh, there is a huge amount of approaches that have been proposed. There's you know, new pathways for CDR being developed every year. Uh, and it may well be that a good portion or even most of the CDR we end up with later this century is from technologies that have yet to be developed today. Um, and certainly the technologies we have today are going to be refined significantly in order to get us to a gigaton scale of, of removals. Um, but even today, we have a huge range of different approaches for CDR uh, across different pathways and it, with different timescales of storage. You know, even though many of us are skeptical of them uh, for many reasons, you know, things like reforestation, afforestation, soil carbon are forms of CDR. And there's CDR that's deployed pretty significantly in a lot of our uh, pathways to get to 1.5 degrees. So in the most recent IPCC report, for example, uh, on average, about half of the CDR, cumulative CDR deployed between now and 2100 comes from afforestation, reforestation, and soil carbon. Um, now, models have the luxury of being able to assume that carbon removed and stored in the biosphere remains there. We might not have that luxury in the real world, and we can talk about that in the Q&A afterwards. Uh, but certainly, there is a lot of potential there, and there's a lot of co-benefits uh, that a lot of people are excited about. Uh, but you know, there are real risks of permanence in those biosphere, biosphere storage. And at the end of the day, if we are replacing a ton of coal that was dug up and burned and emitted to the atmosphere, we need to do so by putting an equivalent amount of carbon back in the geosphere, back in storage that's gonna stay out of the atmosphere for thousands, if not millions of years. Uh, and so there we're mostly looking at pathways that put the carbon into geologic formations that mineralize it, uh, or the put in it to marine sediment, um, but there the time frame can potentially be a little bit shorter, uh, or into deep ocean waters. Um, and there we're looking at things like direct air capture, uh, enhanced weathering, uh, bikers, um, sort of bioenergy with carbon removal, uh, ocean alkalinity enhancement, um, some things like kelp sinking uh, and other approaches. Uh, ocean fertilization is a, a bit fuzzier in terms of storage and, and a bit controversial for many reasons, um, but there's you know, potentially worth doing some exploring there. Um, but yeah, bro broadly speaking, we need to cast a wide net. And because we know we're going to need billions of tons of this in decades to come, we need to figure out what works today. Uh, and we need to be willing to, you know, try a lot of different things and to fail and to learn uh, what works and what doesn't work, which means that when we do things today, to couple them with rigorous monitoring, reporting and verification, um, so others can take, you know, important lessons from what is tried. Uh, and we can sort of collectively build the space together. Uh, and it is important to drive down the cost curve. You know, today permanent CDR is quite expensive. Uh, on average, it's probably around three hundred dollars a ton across all of the approaches we've seen. Uh, and approaches like direct air capture, which are going to be very promising in the long run, are still you know seven hundred dollars a ton or more today. Uh, and so a big part of driving that cost down is learning by doing, uh, deploying more facilities, trying new approaches, new chemistries, new solvents, new electrochemical. Uh, models um, and, you know, seeing if we can replicate the types of dramatic cost reductions we've seen for renewable energy, um, for IT, for many of these other sectors of the economy. Uh, and so at Stripe, we've been trying to do just that. Uh, we've, for, since 2019, uh, we've had a system where people who sign up to Stripe uh, sort of opt in to donating uh, a percent of the purchases they make through Stripe to permanently remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, it's been quite successful. We mobilized many millions or tens of millions of dollars through this. Uh, and we've funded a fairly wide variety of companies, um, specifically trying to sort of maximize shots and goal to find a diverse set of approaches uh, to see where our investments are most catalytic, uh, projects that might not otherwise get off the ground that are very different or very experimental. Um, and that's been a big success. We've gotten a lot of, uh, you know, good companies we're the first purchaser of. Um, we've gotten, you know, for Stripe itself, a lot of good press around this. We're named the most innovative company in the world by Fast Company in large part due to our CDR work. Uh, 
Uh, and we've sort of built on the success we've had here. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll get to Frontier in a second. But when looking at what Stripe invests in, we've really tried to focus on permanent removals. You know, there's no lack of investment out there in biosphere carbon storage uh, by NGOs and volunteer carbon markets. Um, they have their issues. Uh, but at least when we started, there was very, very little being done in terms of permanent removals. Um, you know, there's something like 10,000 tons of permanent removals delivered, uh, you know, to date. Uh, and so what we decided to do when we set up uh, Stripe Climate was to focus on a, a number of target criteria. Uh, permanence. So we wanted to only invest in solutions that permanently store carbon for at least 1,000 years or more. You know, most of the solutions we invest in, it's, it's closer to the hundreds of thousands to millions of years time scale. Um, a thousand years is itself something of a value judgment. You know, there's there's reasons to select it in terms of the amount of time CO2 remains in the atmosphere when it's emitted. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the distinction between sort of 100 plus years and a thousand plus years is primarily comes down to biochar. That's the only, the only real solution and, and potentially ocean uh, fertilization. Those two are the only ones that, at least that we've come across so far, that provide storage in the multiple centuries, but not necessarily the multiple millennia timeframe. Um, other folks are more than happy to invest in biochar and we like biochar, uh, but you know, for us at least, we decided a thousand years was the, the line we wanted to draw uh, on permanence. Uh, we wanted things that minimize the physical footprint. Um, so they take advantage of carbon sinks that are less constrained by arable land. Uh, we wanted technologies that can tell us a story of how they can get down to $100 a ton or below. Obviously, that is going to be a story today because we're not sure exactly how any company is going to get there. But we would at least want you know, them to be able to demonstrate through uh, sort of a bottom-up model that they can get to less than $100 a ton ultimately. Uh, and capacity, you know, we want a solution that has the ability to scale to be a meaningful part of what we ultimately need to address. Uh, so in this case, we set a, a criteria of at least half a gigaton per year uh, when the technology is mature globally. Uh, additionally, we want technologies to be net negative, um, so not significant uh, life cycle emissions that you know undermine their carbon uh, removal benefits. Uh, additional, which thankfully is pretty straightforward for most CDR, um, but you know there still are some questions around additionality that needs to be answered. Uh, verifiable, um, and then we also have strong constraints around environmental justice, safety, and legality. Uh, all of our projects are vetted by a, experts in governance, uh, and making we make sure they have buy-in from local communities, uh, and you know not creating major issues uh, down the road. Uh, and so, in recent years, we've leveraged the success we've had, or I should say, in this year, <laughs> we've leveraged the success we've had in the past with Stripe Climate uh, to expand it dramatically. Uh, so, working with a number of partners, including Alphabet, Shopify, Meta, and McKinsey, uh, we've launched Frontier. Uh, and mobilized around a billion dollars uh, toward creating an advanced market commitment uh, to buy CDR by 2030. Um, we are now working to significantly expand this uh, and get much more money pledged by a wider set of companies. Uh, and we're going to be providing some more information later this summer on how others uh, can join the sort of buyers group uh, for Frontier. Uh, and so Frontier works uh, in sort of modeled roughly off past efforts around vaccine development. Um, you know, the challenge we saw coming into Frontier is that there is a lot of interest from some individual companies in permanent CDR, but there's not necessarily a broader market signal, particularly in the absence of government action. Uh, and so we wanted to create a big enough pool of money that, you know, companies could see that and say, this is a real market. We can build a company around this. We can get investment around this. You know, we can make a return pretty quickly because this is a big enough market to actually do that. Uh, and so we aggregate, you know, the buyers, uh, we vet suppliers uh, and facilitate the purchases, and then the suppliers uh, remove carbon and pass tons back to the buyers. Now, in practice, this ends up being sort of a two-part system, um, because today we're at such an early stage that it's hard to make big purchase contracts with companies. Uh, and so what we do today is we have smaller advanced purchases, um, almost you know, R&D grants in some cases, um, but potentially bigger for, for companies that are a little closer. Uh, and essentially those advanced purchases allow companies to build their first plant, to prove out the technology, they get the money up front. Um, and you know, some of them will fail to deliver. And we are we think that's an acceptable risk because we'll learn something in the process and it'll help move the space forward and, and encourage risk taking. Um, once those companies have made their first delivery, or if there's other more mature companies that have delivered to other people already, 
uh, they can come back to us and say, hey, you know, we want to make a, a much bigger sale to you guys. You know, we've proven that we can actually do this. And in those cases, we'll sign offtake agreements. And those offtake agreements are pay on delivery, but they can be used for uh, project financing uh, and other ways for folks to scale up quickly. Uh, and so I should have shown this slides first. Uh, so this just shows an example of how Frontier uh, will work. Um, so initially we're doing spending on pre-purchases. Uh, we're expecting probably only pre-purchases uh, this year and maybe next year. We'll see if we end up doing any offtakes in 2023. Um, but down the road, uh, we expect offtakes to quickly take over the portfolio as these technologies become more mature and as the price declines. Um, and uh, subsequent reduction in spending on pre-purchases. Well, this graph might not be entirely accurate. We'll probably have some pre-purchase spending even in the latter part of the decade on you know, very new and novel approaches uh, in addition to, to more R&D grants. Um, but the, this is the broad idea of, of transitioning over time from pre-purchases toward offtake uh, once companies have demonstrated that they can successfully deliver. Uh, and so what's next for Frontier? What are we looking forward to in the next few months? Uh, there's a few things. Um, so first, we're focusing on expanding the number of participants in the AMC. Uh, we're potentially going to be lowering the uh, amount of money needed to join, um, which in the first round was in the hundreds of millions. Um, we want to, you know, better tell the story of why this is a good way to spend corporate sustainability dollars. One of the challenges we're finding right now is we approach people and they say, oh, you know, we really think this permanent carbon removal is great. We've only budgeted seven dollars a ton, and we have to meet our, you know, carbon neutrality goals. Uh, and so we've been talking to a lot of players in the space, a lot of the big environmental groups, folks like SBTI and others, uh, around how we can sort of move away from a, a ton for ton framework of accounting in the near term um, to focus very strongly on longer term science based targets for net zero, um, which I should mention currently require only permanent removals uh, to, to neutralize residual emissions. Um, but in the, the short term to, you know, give people credit for investing in uh, higher value things, even if they're not necessarily directly tied to a ton of carbon today. Um, things like permanent carbon removal, things like adaptation funding, things like landscape restoration, um, and trying to, to get away from some of the perverse incentives that dominate the, the voluntary carbon market today, which is, is very much a race to the bottom uh, in terms of price and, and in many cases quality. Uh, and then, you know, we want to catalyze the market to ensure that there is supply by 2030, because um, we are in a situation right now where there's a lot more demand for these permanent removals than there is supply. And so we want to build up the supply of, of high quality removals as quickly as possible. Um, you know, we are working with financers uh, to look uh, at ways to help companies uh, bring first of kind technology to the market and to streamline that and to better tie financing in with offtake agreements once we get to that point. Uh, and we're also talking a lot to policymakers. Uh, Jane Flegel uh, recently joined our team from the White House uh, and is helping a lot on that front. Uh, and you know, we see that while the voluntary market can play an important role in catalyzing the space, you know, at the end of the day, CDR is going to have to be driven by governments in decades to come. And so the faster we can help build those systems and helps get you know, government money flowing towards CDR projects, uh, and creating, you know, some more long-term market certainty around uh, ramping up purchases of CDR, the better it is going to be for the space. And so we're doing some engagements uh, in DC on that front. Um, but with that, you know, I've taken up uh, a fair bit of time already, and I want to leave lots of time for, for questions and, and broader discussion. Um, so yeah, uh, happy. Do you guys want to raise something from the Q&A for me, or, or shall I just go through it? Yeah, well, um, I have a few questions for you that we kind of prepared in advance, and then Mego is going to hop on and ask questions from the Q&A box. And everyone, Perfect. please put your questions in the Q&A box, because it's impossible to manage them. If you put them in the chat, we would be very appreciative. Um, but first question we always ask people is a little bit about your own personal uh, journey, quote unquote, to CDR. Um, can you talk a little bit about when you first became cognizant of the idea of car carbon removal personally, and also maybe a little bit about how you're thinking about it? Has it evolved and and finally your uh, recent decision to move from the research and academic and analysis world to the more commercial world of uh, Stripe and Frontier? So it's a great question. Uh, I think I first started getting interested in CDR probably around 2016 or so. Um, this new set of scenarios that come out uh, or pathways I should say called the shared socioeconomic pathways, the SSPs. Um, and I was starting to, to work with them and analyze them, uh, put together a, a fairly detailed um, 
sort of explainer for Carbon Brief on the SSPs and what they were, um, but also, you know, looking at what the scenarios used to generate them were and what those said about how we're going to meet our most ambitious mitigation targets. Uh, and noticed, you know, this huge amount of, at the time, it was almost all BEX, uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage being employed by these models. Uh, and talked a lot with folks like Glenn Peters and Oliver Geddon around that. Um, you know, Glenn and I worked together on that, that RCP 8.5 piece in nature a few years back. Um, and sort of, that it really got on my radar through that initially. Um, but then I um, got a bit more involved in both explaining 1.5C scenarios, you know, the IPCC special portal 1.5C came out in 2018 and had a huge amount to say on CDR in part because it's almost impossible to, to get to 1.5C without very large amounts of CDR. Uh, and around that same time, I met this fellow uh, named Jeremy Friedman, who was at Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, but wanted to leave and sort of move into the climate space, which was really his passion. Uh, and sort of he reached out to me to see how he could get involved in more in the climate world. Uh, and I ended up helping advise him uh, around the, the founding of uh, Carbon Plan and was on their board for the first year of the organization. Uh, and so we got to know a lot more about CDR through Carbon Plan's excellent work in the space. Uh, and so in the last year, um, when I decided to, to leave Breakthrough, I had been talking to, to Ryan and others at Stripe and NAN for close to a year at that point, just around various uh, questions on CDR and, and how best to scale it. And you know, this was before the AMC was even an idea. So we were sort of still like, how do we really create the supply? And, and you know, how do we position this space to, to be where it needs to be in decades to come? Uh, and so when the opportunity came to, to join Stripe's rapidly growing team around this, uh, you know, it, it was too good an offer to pass up. Uh, and I spent about a decade prior to more academic work in the private sector and sort of missed the speed at which it moves, the ability to actually get stuff done in the real world that we don't necessarily have in academia. Uh, and so it seemed like a, a great opportunity to, to go back to doing a bit more, uh, you know, boots on the ground type work uh, and, and actually getting stuff built. Got it. Um, excellent. Thank you. Uh, here's a little bit of a wonky question that that comes up quite a bit on uh, quote unquote climate Twitter. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, equivalence in terms of a net carbon cycle response of a ton of uh, reduced emissions or mitigation and a ton of carbon removal? And just mm -hmm. kind of outline what that means. Are they the same? Are they different? So you know? we have we have a saying in the climate world that carbon is forever. Uh, and I think you know a lot of people underappreciate just how long our emissions remain in the atmosphere. Uh, so a lot of things we emit like methane are very unstable. They'll burn if you light them on fire. Uh, and they also have ways to sort of chemically break down in the atmosphere. CO2, on the other hand, is a very stable gas. It does not break down at all in the atmosphere. Uh, and so the only way to get CO2 out of the atmosphere is for it to be absorbed by other parts of the Earth's system, primarily the oceans and the biosphere. And so if we emit a ton of CO2 today, say we burn a, you know, a third of a ton of coal today, uh, about 20% of that CO2 will still be in the atmosphere in 10,000 years. Uh, and about 10% will still be in the atmosphere in 500,000 years. And so there's this huge long tail of our emissions today. And that means when we think about removals and when we want to be able to claim that we're making this removal that is undoing this emission, we wanna make sure it has the same physical climate effect. Um, we don't wanna sort of draw an arbitrary line after hundred years and say, as long as it's fine over hundred years, then you know, it's a wash because you know, we're making decisions that are gonna affect future generations here. We, we don't want to you know, implicitly apply very high discount rates to these sort of things uh, and kick the climate can down the road by only investing in, in short-term removals. And so when we think about CDR and making specifically around making offset claims, making equivalency claims to our emissions, we really want to strongly weigh the permanence on that because our emissions themselves are, are very permanent in the atmosphere. Uh, and so that's sort of how I think about it, that, you know, if, if you were to, to decide to do a certain amount of removal and claim it's equivalent to a certain amount of emissions, you need to be able to justify that over not just the next few decades or the next century, but over the very long-term lifetime of, of our emissions today. Um, I got it on durability, but it is, is a ton of emissions reduction equivalent to a ton of durable carbon removal? Um, and I believe the answer is it's complicated, but more or less. Um, yeah, it's complicated, but more or less. So when we put a ton of carbon into the atmosphere today, as I mentioned earlier, only about 
40% of it is still in the atmosphere after 100 years, because um, about half is absorbed, or a little more than half is absorbed by the oceans in the atmosphere. When we remove a ton of carbon from the atmosphere, that same process happens in reverse. There's sort of uh, compensating carbon cycle responses that replace about half of what we've removed with carbon from the ocean and the biosphere. Um, otherwise, removals would be twice as effective as emissions, which would be great for us, uh, but unfortunately we don't live in that world. Uh, but in terms of the climate's response to removals, it, it's very similar. You know, it, at least before we get to zero, it's effectively the same because you're just reducing the amount of CO2 that ends up in the atmosphere. Once you get below zero and you're in sort of a ne negative world, then there's a slight asymmetry in climate response between removals and emissions, but it's only a few percent, at least in, in our most recent models. So it's, it's small enough to effectively ignore. Um, and, you know, the, in large part, you if you remove... Uh, a trillion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere has roughly the same cooling effect as you get if you add a trillion tons of CO2 to the atmosphere, uh, at least up to a point. You know, there is a concern that particularly in higher warming scenarios, you know, if you want warm the world up to three or four degrees, wait a few hundred years and then suck all that back out, you'll create more opportunity for Earth system responses like permafrost melting uh, and other factors that would not be reversible through CDR. Um, so, so with caveats, it's the same, but uh, not always the same. Um, thank you. Um, one of the things that we are trying to illustrate with the series is that carbon removal is a range of approaches. You had a slide that illustrated that well. I think Frontier Stripes purchases illustrate that well. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, an article from James Temple in the MIT Tech Review that came out last week. And James Temple, who I think is, if not the best, one of the very best um, journalists out there covering carbon removal. It was about Running Tide, um, which Stripe has supported and who has been on this program. And it was, I think, it was... It, it was pretty negative, I would say. I think all the scrutiny is fair. I think personally, it might've been a little bit unfair in terms of not presenting a, a scientific point of view that was more favorable toward running tide. But can you talk a little, I think with a lot of these carbon removal approaches, there's gonna be some level of uncertainty um, in terms of their effect, potentially co-benefits and harms. Um, and there's also a lot of macro level climate uncertainty about how screwed we are if we don't do something. So can you talk a little bit about how you would suggest that we balance uncertainty versus the larger climate risk and the need to actually act? Does that question? So it's a great, yeah, it, it's a great question. And you know, not every CDR approach is going to work, um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try it, right? You know, we may discover many new approaches we're not even thinking of today, and we may fail many times along the way. And, and that's you know, part of, of creating a, a robust and dynamic industry. Uh, and so with Stripe and, and now with Frontier, you know, we are purposely trying to cast a very wide net and support a wide diversity of approaches because we really feel this is the decade to figure out what works and what doesn't work. That said, there are some interesting questions around what I like to think of as irreducible uncertainties. You know, it's pretty straightforward with something like direct air capture. You know, you're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, you can measure how much you're removing, you're putting it into geologic storage. There's some small uncertainty around the, you know, multi-thousand year durability of compressed CO2 in the ground if you're not mineralizing it, but that's that's a tractable and, and sort of understandable system. Um, once you move into things like ocean kelp sinking or alkalinity enhancement, you're dealing with much larger uncertainties that are harder to effectively measure because it's almost impossible to directly measure how much CO2 is being absorbed from the atmosphere into the oceans by these interventions. And so you're sort of dealing with second order proxies or you know complex ocean system models and ocean biogeochemistry models that themselves are imperfect and constantly being improved over time. Uh, and so while we there is a big role for improved instrumentation and better funding from the broader uh, philanthropic and research communities around monitoring these things, and we're also just not going to know for sure today. And so there's an open question for us at, with Frontier of, of how we balance those uncertainties. Uh, certainly for our advanced purchases that we've done to date and will continue to do for early stage technologies, you know, we are not too worried about those as long as they pass, you know, the vetting by our external scientific uh, experts and, and our staff scientists. Um, but in terms of bigger offtake agreements, where we sort of want companies to verify the delivery of removals before signing on to those, you know, we are going to have a much higher bar uh, in terms of measurement and verification. Uh, and so 
you know, I think all of these companies who we've purchased from and ones we haven't purchased from are thinking very hard about these issues. They're figuring out the sort of the chain of proofs they need at each stage to show that, you know, the thing actually grew, the thing actually ended up where they say it would end up, the ocean chemistry changed in the way they said it was going to change. Uh, and, you know, we're still in the early stages for a lot of that, uh, but a lot of smart people are thinking about it. A lot of people are developing and deploying instrumentation to better measure it. Um, and, you know, I think that we are starting to have some of these broader community level discussions around where do we need people who are not the sellers making investments in better tracer studies or better earth system models or other, you know, areas where we can get more certainty on, in some of these processes. And that isn't just the oceans, you know, another example is with a lot of bikers, uh, sort of bioenergy uh, with carbon removal projects or biomass with carbon removal projects. You know, there are impacts on feedstock prices. Uh, you know, if you're buying up corn stover to turn it, turn it into bio oil, in the case of Charm, for example, you know, you are substantially increasing the profits that corn farmers can make in some cases. Um, and that will have some effect on their planting decisions uh, and, you know, potentially on alternative use cases for those uh, feedstocks. And so there's some questions where, you know, a seller might not have a team of economists who can build a economic agricultural model to predict secondary, you know, planting decision effects of feedstock prices, but someone should do that. Uh, and those are the, the sort of questions that we're trying to wrestle with right now in thinking of, you know, who should own the MRV side of permanent carbon removal, um, because it, it's very important we get those systems up sooner rather than later. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully we'll have more on that in the not too distant future. Great answer to a not easily answerable question. I think I would add too that I think we also need to keep in mind that everyone who's working on CDR and climate more generally, it's not like we're trying to develop derivatives on subprime mortgage mortgage backed securities. Everyone's trying to like address the climate. So I think it's important to like assume positive intent from, you know, everyone who's working in this. Yeah, state. And everyone's trying hard. And it's also important to realize that by its nature, permanent carbon removal is, is sort of much better than existing voluntary carbon market approaches. You know, we're not having to deal with these fiendish counterfactual additionality questions. You know, we have, in most cases, a pretty firm basis for believing that CO2 is actually being removed, even if there's some uncertainty in exactly how much. Uh, and so, you know, even though we have a long way to go to, to deal with effective MRV, you know, we're starting from a much better place than say soil carbon or even tree planting or uh, avoided emission uh, projects um, today. All right. So I, I have many more questions, but I want to leave some time for audience questions. Also, I, I messaged you in the chat, but would you have a couple minutes to stay on after the hour to handle the questions or do you have a hard stop at 10? Um, let me check. Uh, unfortunately, I do have a hard stop. Okay. Have we'll another call. All right. Um, Mega is going to hop on now and ask questions for the next 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, I'll try to get through as many as possible, but um, yeah, so I'll start with one just um, sort of on the engineering side of things um, or on the technical side. So someone said, given the significant uh, cost difference between a degree of cooling achieved from CDR versus a degree of cooling from geoengineering, uh, what is your thinking around geoengineering as a strategy, um, you know, also to address overshoot and how do you, you know, how do you see that potentially shifting over time? It's a great question. I mean, I think when we're talking about so geoengineering is a very broad term and, and arguably CDR is a type of geoengineering, even though we don't like to call it that. Um, but I, I assume the questioner is, is specifically asking around solar radiation management, which is the most common sort of geoengineering uh, rapid cooling approach to discuss today. And for that, you know, I, I think the first thing to, to mention is that it doesn't actually permanently solve the problem, right? <laughs> you're, if you're putting sulfate aerosols in the stratosphere, those are relatively short-lived. And so you're having to continually deploy sulfate aerosols. And if you ever stop, you're gonna have a pretty sharp termination shock. Uh, and so, you know, it could potentially bias time to do CDR <coughs> in a world where, you know, we realize that the climate is going to pass some sort of threshold and we are, or the impacts are getting so severe, we urgently need to cool things down. Uh, but it's a Band-Aid. It's not fundamentally solving the problem. And at best, it's just buying time for us to deploy CDR at a larger scale. Um, I think the other challenge around solar geoengineering specifically is that once someone starts doing it, they own the weather. You know, if the monsoon in India doesn't come next year, they're going to blame whoever did the, the solar geoengineering, even if, you know, it just happened to be a freak weather event. Uh, 
Uh, and I think the geopolitics of that become very messy very quickly. And we're also just learning increasingly that there are negative side effects on agricultural yields, on precipitation patterns, on others through these sort of uh, interventions. Uh, and so, you know, I think we should do much more research on geoengineering than we're doing today in, in soil radiation management. Um, but I think it's best thought of as sort of a, a break glass in case of emergency uh, box to have if, you know, climate ends up being a lot more tippy than we think, uh, rather than, you know, a, a solution per se. Right, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, another sort of on the technical side question uh, was, do you have any thoughts on iron salt, iron salt aerosols to oxidize methane as a form of geoengineering that is more uh, permanent as opposed to SRM? It's a good question. I haven't looked specifically into that mechanism. I mean, the, the one challenge around methane removal as an approach, uh, and I think there is some promising stuff being done there, uh, but you know, the best way to remove methane from the atmosphere is to reduce its emissions. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not the case for CO2. You know, if we re reduce CO2 emissions, the atmosphere concentrations just stop increasing. They don't really fall much, at least until we get close to zero. And so, you know, methane is ultimately a flow pollutant and CO2 is a stock pollutant. And so the case for methane removal in some ways is weaker than the case for CO2 removal, just because you can reduce concentrations by reducing emissions. That said, you know, as I discussed earlier, there's going to be some residual emissions that we can't fully eliminate. And so for those, it certainly makes a lot more sense, or it makes a lot of sense to, to look at methane removal approaches. Got it. Yeah. Um, okay. And then in terms of the approaches out there, uh, what do you see as the most promising one, you know, just in your own opinion, or to what extent do you think it's going to be something we haven't even thought of yet? I mean, I'm personally pretty bullish on direct air capture just because it's in some ways the most straightforward approach and easily measurable. Uh, that said, you know, it, it is very energy intensive. And, you know, while there's a lot of neat approaches that at least on paper look like they're going to be much more efficient, particularly electrochemical approaches, uh, we still need to see them proven out and need to see the, the level of cost declines. Um, so I think in the long run, you know, director capture might be the, the biggest bucket I, I'd see, um, but I don't think it's going to be the only one by any means. You know, I think there's certainly a lot of near term low tech things around enhanced rock weathering that are pretty exciting. Um, and I think there's huge potential in the oceans, but there's a lot of outstanding questions around, you know, how much of the carbon reduced actually ends up coming out of the atmosphere versus the oceans that need to be answered uh, in that respect. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, and then thinking a little bit more about just the markets and sort of regulation around this, um, someone asked, do you see any kind of risk that carbon credit demand will break down uh, over time? What is your take on regulated carbon credits? And is there any realistic chance that we're going to see a global carbon certificate market, or at least, you know, the EU, US, and a few others like that? So it's a good question. I'm, I'm not too worried about demand for permanent removals breaking down over time. I, I think we could have some reassessment of the current voluntary markets uh, and some significant tightening of standards, which I think would be a good thing for everyone, because to be honest, there is a lot of crap out there right now, uh, and a lot of stuff that's being bought that isn't actually re resulting in, in any removals. Uh, and you know, as we were discussing earlier, James Temple uh, has many, many good pieces uh, discussing the, the issues there. Um, but I think particularly given that you know, more and more companies are committing towards science-based targets and the sort of the science-based target initiative framework specifically says only permanent removals can count toward neutralization to meet the science-based target. You know, I think there's a strong basis there for, for building up demand in that space over time. Um, so I'm not too worried about that. I do think that we are going to see some incorporation of these into compliance markets sooner rather than later. You know, California is already talking a bunch about that. Uh, there's a lot of talk about 45Q and, and how that's going to be applied to these things. You know, there's the new DAC hubs, of course. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm less involved in, in conversations there and less aware of them, but it makes a lot of sense uh, for some of these things to, you know, ultimately feed into, say, the EU ETS, particularly since prices there are already quite high, um, and getting to the point at which permanent, high-quality permanent removals are, are potentially going to be cost competitive uh, with the, the price of EU ETS credits. Um, and so I think once we, as a community, do a better job of putting in place, you know, strong MRV protocols uh, and, you know, building more trust among policymakers that these permanent removals are, in fact, equivalent to emissions it'll be a lot easier to fold them into compliance markets uh, in a way that doesn't replicate the sort of flaws of the clean development mechanism and some of these previous efforts uh, that did have a lot of hot air. Right. Um, okay, a few questions on just how Stripe and the Frontier Fund are structuring things and you know planning things. So when you think about structuring contracts, you know, let's say with someone who has, I guess, a proven technology, but might be still scaling up, um, how do you structure that, um, and you know how long how long do they have to deliver on that? Because a lot of them obviously are still building up capacity and things. Um, 
how do you kind of work out the right time frame to set up for delivery? Yeah, so for the advanced purchases that we're doing today um, that are, are relatively small scale, you know, we're talking in that the half a million to small million uh, range, you know, we're fairly flexible with those. We realize that a lot of, of companies are the very early stage that, you know, in some cases we'll be investing in a team that has like a lab bench prototype, uh, but doesn't necessarily have anything actually built yet. And so we're happy to, you know, accept delivery in 2026, 2027. You know, I think in one case we've even done 2029, though that's pushing it a bit given the timeframes that, that we're looking at to, to scale up. Um, and, you know, at the same time, we're, we're going to be doing parallel off-take agreements with folks who have proven, you know, that they can deliver uh, tons and, and are scaling up rapidly. Um, and so we see both of those, you know, continuing to play a role and we want to maximize flexibility for supporting the early stage stuff. Uh, and I think, we're going to be announcing our uh, next round of purchases uh, in a few weeks, uh, and there we'll, we'll actually have an explicit R&D grant we're giving uh, to a company who, you know, is very early, early stage, but we're potentially excited about the approach. Um, and so we've, we're potentially going to explore more stuff like that as well going forward. Great, yeah. Um, all right, and then I know you mentioned earlier that vaccines were kind of an example of where advanced market commitments um, were driven. And, you know, obviously the, a lot of those have been sponsored by countries and states. Um, is Stripe thinking about, or Stripe or Frontier, thinking about partnering with um, countries or governments uh, in addition to companies for any of the future funds you might be doing? So it's certainly something we're open to. You know, I could definitely see a world where governments ideally would be running a program and we could help provide advice uh, and, you know, the learnings we have from our experience with this. Um, but, you know, I, I think it might be a bit weird if, if we are, you know, managing the US investments in <laughs> at a very large scale in these things. And, and to be honest, that shouldn't be our role. You know, we're here to kickstart the space. And, you know, we're, we have in some ways a higher risk tolerance today than, you know, governments are going to have when they want to do these things. You know, governments, as we've learned, unfortunately, I have a hard time affording a cylindra, whereas, you know, we see failure as a necessary part of success and sort of the, the faster we can move the space forward for everyone, the better. Um, so there's some potential tension there, I'd, I'd say, but, you know, I, we definitely want to get more involved with, with those projects and, and bring, you know, have more collaboration with governments on these things. Great. One last one before I hand this back over to Toby. Um, so how do you think about communicating the urgency of CDR without minimizing the urgency for things like deep mitigation? Um, or to put it another way, um, how do you answer the question as to why frontier climate is not focused on deep mitigation and then, you know, is focusing in on CDR instead? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to emphasize that all of the participants in Frontier are themselves focused on deep mitigation, right? You know, Google has their 24-7 clean energy initiative that they've been doing in recent years. You know, the other members have, you know, net zero targets and, and strong commitments around emission reductions. And so I think it's important when we're talking about CDR to always lead with, you know, we know we need to reduce emissions dramatically and we know we're going to need some CDR as well. And so, you know, we, we sort of talk about it as, we saw this as a area that had significant underinvestment compared to mitigation. You know, there's $750 billion a year being spent today on mitigation, on, on uh, renewable energy deployments, on electric vehicles, and all these things globally. There's, you know, at least until this year, well under a billion dollars a year being spent on permanent removals. Uh, and so, you know, we see it as an area we can have a big impact, even if it's always going to remain, or at least for the next decade, certainly going to remain relatively small compared to the amount we're spending on mitigation. Great. Um, Zeke, thank you so much for being here. That was great. And I'm going to hand us back to Toby to just- Of course. And if, uh, if folks have any questions that I didn't answer, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, which is at the end of my presentation and I'm sure it can be shared uh, with uh, the guests. Sounds good. Um, Zeke, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you being here. And that was a really insightful and, and helpful um, presentation. Um, just want a couple programming notes. Uh, first of all, a merch note. Um, uh, open Air has a t-shirt series and we have a new merch drop uh, and I uh, Open Air love basalt, um, which is fantastic. There'll be a link in the chat where you can get yours um, for excellent summer wear. Another open air project, we are doing a summer of citizen lobbying for the federal CDRLA, which is an amazing um, policy introduced in US Congress um, in the House by Senator Peters from California and Representative, sorry, Representative Peters from California and Representative Tonko from, uh, from Albany, New York, and um, in the Senate by Senators Whitehouse and Coons. And um, please follow the link in the chat. Um, basically, we're setting up a system so that you can create lobbying groups to contact your own local representatives to get them to support the bill and CDR more generally, which is super important. 
Uh, next up on this is CDR. Uh, next week, we have a really interesting uh, session with Solitaire, which is a Finnish um, direct air capture company producing a modular direct air capture um, uh, technology that can be integrated with building HVAC systems. Uh, very interesting. Sea field, we're going to be dark on July 5th. Sea fields, which is an ocean based biomass uh, solution, which will be uh, interesting to talk about in the context of uh, the recent article on running tide. The 19th, we're going to have to read books, so stay tuned. 26, climate robotics, which is a modular uh, biochar pyrolysis uh, system. And then finally, in August, we have a bunch of great stuff coming up. Carbion, which is a Netherlands based X Prize milestone award winning direct air capture company. CarboFX, which is another Finnish carbon removal company focused on biochar, and we'll have more to announce uh, shortly. Um, thank you all for being with us. Sorry to run in a minute or two over the hour, um, but thanks for being with us. And thank you again to Zeke for such a great presentation. And we will see you all uh, next week, hopefully. Be well. Thank you.